Hello, I'm Matthew Weinstock, Managing Editor of Modern Healthcare. Thank you for tuning into the latest edition of The Checkup. One of the lasting tolls and impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic is sure to be the heightened attention that everyone is paying to behavioral health issues that are facing millions and millions of Americans these days. In past episodes of The Checkup, we've talked to leaders from pediatric hospitals and pediatric health systems about the challenges facing children and adolescents and the unique circumstances they face. Well, today we're going to turn our attention a little bit to the adult population. And I'm very pleased to welcome Stuart Archer. He's president and CEO of Oceans Healthcare, a behavioral healthcare provider that operates facilities in Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. We're going to talk a little bit about what they're seeing in their marketplaces, but also this broader idea of, of addressing behavioral health going forward. Stuart, thank you so much for being with us. Well, and, and thank you, Matthew, for having us and, and allowing us to be part of this dialogue. Absolutely. So just before we delve into some of the issues, um, you know, a lot of our viewers, readers may not be familiar with Oceans Healthcare. As I said, you're operating those three states in the south. Uh, give us a little bit of demographic on, on your operations. Uh, 23, I believe, facilities, right, in those That's three correct. states? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But thank you for uh, again for for uh, asking us to join today. Uh, Oceans as an organization has been uh, around for almost twenty years, a, a quiet part of the behavioral health uh, industry. Uh, today, we we operate uh, across the southeast and um, in in communities that that others find challenging, and and historically in a space that's been underrepresented uh, in the behavioral health industry. Our roots and and, and again, a large focus of our organization are uh, in the care of uh, the behavioral health needs of older adults in geriatrics, uh, a space that's been fairly underrepresented uh, represented historically in this dialogue. And, and certainly over those years, we've expanded our services to include adult and adolescent services and, and with a real emphasis on outpatient services as well, hoping to uh, extend our reach and, and work with our patients in, in whatever way we can. Got it. So let's talk a little bit then, Stuart, about what you've been seeing over the past year. Um, again, as I sort of alluded to at the beginning, mental health, behavioral health has really started to come to the forefront as mm -hmm. the pandemic wore on and, and social isolation and things like that were taking hold. What have you seen in your marketplaces mm -hmm. of, you know, in terms of the impact of behavioral health mm -hmm. on your patient population? Sure. Um, you know, I think that every every provider uh, has had its own journey through through COVID, and certainly a lot of the national attention and the and the focus has been on the care of and the and the interventions posed in ICUs and and in more traditional acute care settings, which makes sense. But it, but as a backdrop, I think the behavioral health industry and, and ourselves specifically um, have, have certainly um, seen our own challenges. And, and you know, I think if, if, if COVID has done anything, it has opened a door, I think, for folks who maybe um, who, who, who thought of behavioral health as something that happened maybe over there or something that happened to other people um, or, or some other healthcare provider took care of that. I think COVID has opened a window for everyone as we've experienced this isolation, as we've experienced these changes that, that have affected us all, that the behavioral health and mental health is something that, that affects every one of us. It, all of our employees, all of our health systems, all of our communities have experienced tremendous stress during these periods. Um, and certainly I think it's, it's brought to light the inadequacies and I think the, you know, how much work is still left to be done in this industry to connect patients with just sometimes the most basic of services. And so have you seen real peaks in certain markets that you operate in and, and maybe not so much in other markets? You know, I, I think we, we have, and I, and I think as we've seen um, COVID, um, as, as we've seen these different waves of COVID, uh, you know, hit our communities. And, and certainly, as, as we've seen the COVID numbers drop a bit, although I think we're still, you know, we're beginning to see those rise a little bit more, um, we are seeing a mental health um, uh, epidemic begin to follow. You know, what we what, what we saw as a, as a physical uh, pandemic. Um, and, and so today for, um, for our adult patients and for our geriatric patients, and then certainly our, our, our adolescents, um, we're seeing a surge in need um, you know, follow uh, this pandemic. 
Yeah, and I think one of the things that's been interesting to to or that I'd like to talk to you about is that isolation and loneliness factor. Mm -hmm. You know, as you said, we've sort of at the beginning have focused on those patients who were in the hospital. But I'm curious what you've been doing and how you've been reaching those those seniors and adult patients who are at home, who are alone, and they've been isolated there because of social distancing and the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And what kind of um, impact you've seen on on their behavioral health that that isolation and loneliness factor? Sure. I mean, I, I think that the the isolation is something that we probably all felt at some point during this pandemic, and many of us continue to feel as we're as we're disconnected from. The, 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 you know some of the basic social norms that we have in our in our day. Um, humans are social creatures. We're, we're we're wired to be connected to others, and and certainly as we age, we know that that plays not only a um, you know a part of our healthcare, but a fundamental part of our day and our well being. And so for for many of our patients, the the needed protections that were put into place during the pandemic have, have now affected a whole other part of their health care. And so uh, at Oceans, one of the biggest things that we try to do is find a way to stay connected with our patients. I think this is where the 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 um, the innovations around telemedicine, we were early adopters of those in, in the nursing homes and in SNF units and in other areas, we're partnering with home health providers across our states to support the work that they were doing. But, but, but all too often in behavioral health, we've, we've made the patient come to us or we've made the patient meet us on our terms. And I think one of the things that COVID has made us rethink and I think has made the industry continue to rethink is you know, how do we provide services in a way that's accessible by the patient on the patient's terms? Yeah, that's interesting. We hear that a lot on the, the physical health side, right? care for the patient where the patient can be cared for, whether it's a, a retail clinic or something like that. Um, it's interesting to hear you talk about that perspective from a behavioral health setting to think about meeting the patient on, on their terms as well. Mm -hmm. um, you, you referenced telehealth. Uh, I'm curious, um, it's worked, but what are the limitations for you in terms sure. of um, telehealth from a behavioral health care standpoint? Yeah, you know, a, a couple thoughts, and I and I and I think that you know telehealth provides has the ability to provide anonymity, which at times can be the biggest barrier to care. We hear over and over and over that the parking lot at the therapist's office or the parking lot at the psychiatrist's office is the single biggest barrier to care, in the sense that there still is this stigma. Someone from my community or someone from my church sees me in that parking lot, what are they going to think about me? And so um, I think on the positive side, telehealth does provide the needed anonymity, especially early in these interactions for folks to feel comfortable and understanding what treatment is and, and what it isn't. Um, I, I think the limitations are for the more moderate and for the severely mentally ill, um, you know, technology is proving to be less effective. And I think um, not not because of something the therapist or doctor isn't doing, but I think there's just inherent limitations, um, you know, too many of those interactions. And so I think that's why, you know, we view these as adjuncts. We view these as an important tool in the toolkit, if you will. But but, you know, certainly something that is provided on a continuum of services. So as we start to see, um, you know, states open up and loosen restrictions, um, Texas obviously has, has done that more than some other states. What do you think that that balance is between where you are going to be providing telehealth services versus more in-person services? Have you mm -hmm. fact, have you thought through that process yet? You know, we, we have. And I think I think many of those answers are, are still up in the air a little bit. I think that is, you know, we're having it, it appears to be a national dialogue. And I think a fair amount of of hand wringing about what is going to be the long term status of, of patients and their ability to access care through telemedicine. We we provide care to several rural areas where where internet connectivity is even tough. So doing therapy and having interactions with caregivers through voice is still really important. And so from our perspective, um, you know, we're, we're always very skeptical of silver bullets, things that, you know, fix everything. The, again, I think this is an important tool in the toolkit of providers and for communities. And, and I think it, it would seem, um, 
it, it, it would seem, you know, really tough to put this back in the bag. I mean, I think we as providers have been waiting for this to be paid for and funded in a manner similar to, to other levels of care. And it would, it would seem to, um, it would seem to be tough to go backwards in this, in this aspect. Yeah. And I, I definitely want to talk about that funding, the payment piece, mm -hmm. um, you know, mental health parity, even though we have the mm -hmm. national law, it, we're still, coming up short on some of that parity issue, those parity issues. So where do you need to see reimbursement change um, going sure. forward for behavioral health? Well, th this could be a, this, this could be its own, its own uh, talk almost <laughs> in of itself. But I would, I would say from my perspective, I think, I think parity is still an aspiration. Um, I think we, we work with, um, you know, a wide range of, of payers. Our organization has always, um, uh, strove to be an in-network provider, and so we work with a wide range of payers, with, with frankly a very wide range of approaches when it comes to behavioral health. Um, I, I, I think that you know, from you know, I, I look at what we can control as a provider, and, and I think you know, many times the advice that we give our patients and our loved ones is is the same ones that we try to take as organization. Um, and and so, from a provider standpoint, what what we can control is partnering with payers on evidence-based outcome data. And I think that's one thing our industry could do better is engaging proactively in outcome data, outcome studies, and really looking at what is making an impact. There, there, there is an inherent skepticism still with some payers around behavioral health services. And, and, I, and I think that it's, you know, it, that, that, that piece of parity is still an area that we're working on as an industry. And, and I think the best way to combat that is proactive dialogue around the, what does a successful outcome look for, for a patient in this space? Yeah, that's a, 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 I think that's been an ongoing challenge for this space, right, is to create those metrics um, that are that are really solid and measurable, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. um, who are you working with to try to help develop some of those metrics? You know, we have worked, uh, you know, pretty closely with, with frankly, a wide range of people. Um, you know, all of the states that we operate in have, have, you know, we've partnered with them pretty close to look at, you know, the outcome data that resonates with them. I, and I would say, from a from a Medicare perspective, you know, you know certainly we 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 provide and 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 play a part in those. But we've, um, you know, I think many of the metrics that we're looking at today or that we're asking to be provided uh, really are more utilization metrics than outcome metrics. And so I think we're, we're dealing with individuals who many, many times this is going to be a chronic illness. And so I think we've got to change our mindset. You know, length of stay is not a quality metric as we like to stay. And so, you know, thinking um, you know, bigger picture and connecting um, uh, patients to services is crucial. We, we, we championed um, both in Louisiana and in Mississippi um, the addition of outpatient services for, for Medicaid patients. And, and, I, and I'm happy to say that in both states, um, both the governor and the secretaries of health supported those. Um, and, and I think the addition of those services has made a, a huge impact in the lives of those patients. Presence. Got it. Got it. And Stuart, lastly, you referenced some of the partnerships you're doing with payers, but also you talked about uh, the partnerships you've done with some SNFs and mm -hmm. other facilities. I know you recently, uh, I think, opened a facility with Oxner Health System, right? Yeah. In, so can you just talk about where you see um, the need for greater partnerships mm -hmm. between behavioral health providers such as yourself and those more traditional acute care health systems? Sure. Well, I think, first of all, it starts with behavioral health providers being at the table. You know, all too often there are there, there's a dialogue going on around behavioral health, good or bad. There's there's conversations going on around patients. And, and all too often, the, the behavioral health providers are still not at the table, whether it be legislatively, whether it be from a from a from a funding or, or different areas. And so I, I think, you know, progressive health systems, health systems that are leading or um, are, 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 are definitely saying, look, how, how, how can we do more for our behavioral health patients in our community? And we were, we were certainly honored to, to uh, partner with Ochsner uh, and LSU uh, in Louisiana to build uh, one of the premier uh, behavioral health facilities uh, in Louisiana. 
Um, and, and I think that, you know, they, it, it starts with um, the behavioral health patient, which both LSU and Auctioner um, certainly share the same sentiment that we do, um, that they deserve access and a quality of treatment equal to any other patient that enters the hospital. Um, but recognizing that this, this patient's going to have a special journey, they're going to need a special, um, a special set of caregivers, and they're going to need to be connected on an ongoing basis with, with services that may be in person, that may be accessible through technology, but that, again, meet them where they are. Got it. Got it. Well, Stuart, we appreciate your time. Um, you know, obviously, behavioral health, the behavioral health crisis is one that we could talk for much more than 15 minutes, <laughs> um, but we definitely appreciate you taking some time here, and we, we'd love to check back in with you you know, as we get out of the pandemic and sort of see where behavioral health goes from here, um, hopefully sure. it can continue to be a national dialogue. Well, thank, thank you again for your, your time today. Thank you, Stuart. And I'm Matthew Weinstock with Modern Healthcare. Be sure to come back next Monday for another edition of The Checkup.